नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वायुधम सुधुमूलम उभायोर विजकी अयुधस्मादुमाथे सेनायोर इवायुधम सुथुमूल उभायोर विजकी शो आयुधाश्मायोर इवायुधम सुथुमूल उभायोर विजिकी शो आयुधाश्मायोरभिथे श्रेनयोर paired yudham we fight sutumulam very furious ubhayo between the two of them vijigishato who both were striving to win ayudha with weapons ashma stones drumai the trees dorbhi with their arms karabya karyan arate for the sake srena srena yo between two hawks eva as if 
The two fought furiously in single combat, each determined to win, contending against each other with various weapons and then with stones, tree trunks, and finally their bare arms. They struggled like two hawks battling over a piece of flesh. Asitad ashta vimsaham itare tara mushtibhi vrajra nishpesha Parushayar avistramam aharanisham. The fight went on without rest for 28 days. The two opponents striking each other with their fists, which fell like cracking blows of lightning. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti points out that the fight continued day and night without intermission. Om Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitam Ye Nabhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Pandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutha Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahakana Raghunathan Vitham Tham Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chakatpate Kopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brinda Baneshwari Brishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpatru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Evacha Patitanam Bhavani Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 56, entitled The Shamantaka Jewel, Text 23 and 24. Within this story, there are many lessons, each one crucial to understand for our making spiritual progress. The last several days, His Holiness Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj has eloquently spoken from these verses. So if you want to make spiritual progress, please listen to the tapes of his classes. And I will try to speak something myself today on your 
request. <clears throat> Parikshit Maharaj was very interested to know the story of the Shamantakaju. The chapter begins with his Krishna or Sukadev Goswami telling some little bit of Satrajit and the Jewel. Parikshit wanted to hear more. And as we know, Parikshit Maharaj was inquiring from Shukadev Goswami not only for his own spiritual benefit, but for the benefit of all living beings for all time. In the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Parikshit Maharaj is inquiring that you have just told me about the hellish planets in the fifth canto and all different types of suffering that takes place there. How can one be liberated from having to endure such suffering? Shukadev Goswami he said, for every particular type of sinful activity, there is a particular atonement that one can perform to free oneself from the reactions of those sins. Parikshit Maharaj, he further inquired that even if a person atones from sinful activity, Still, the seed desire for enjoyment, that greed, that envy, that arrogance is still there and it will impel one to engage in sinful activities again. So it seems this process of sinning and then atoning and sinning and then atoning, it's like an elephant that bathes in a river and then comes out and with its trunk throws dust all over its body again. What is the actual way of removing that core desire that impels one to, get to, to indulge in immoral activities? From that question, Shukadev Goswami told the story of Ajamiya. How the chanting of the holy names, how engaging in the process of devotional service as Rupa Goswami tells, it goes right to the core of the heart to remove the propensity, the inclination for its selfish material activities. But our acharyas explain how Parikshit Maharaj, he had seven days to live around this time of the sixth canto being spoken, he only had a few more days to live. He wasn't asking for himself, but being the great king that he was, he was paradukaduki. He was genuinely compassionate for everyone. So he was speaking on behalf of all the conditioned souls so that the Srimad Bhagavatam would be our light forever. So Parikshit Maharaj is inquiring about the story of the Shaman Takachu. Its relevant is so important because we're all most of us at least, we're trying to be devotees. We're following certain regulative principles. We have some sadhana. We have some nice association. We've engaged in service. And some of us, because we do that, we become a little complacent, thinking I'm rightly situated for so many years. But in this story we find 
what happened to a person named Satrajit, who happens to be a member of the Yadu dynasty. How many of us can claim to be members of the Yadu dynasty? Not just with some, you know, caste title, but being a member of the Yadu dynasty, living in Dwarka at the time that Krishna is there. Very special position. The Yadus are very dear to Lord Krishna. We read in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita how um, that devotee wanted to understand who is the greatest person. And he went to a king performing yajna, who told him, what is my yajna compared to Indra? He's the greatest. He went to Indra. What, is, what am I doing compared to Brahma? Brahma said, I'm nothing compared to Shiva. Shiva, I'm nothing compared to Prahlad. Prahlad, well, what am I doing compared to Hanuman? And every devotee was always thinking somebody else is better than me. Most of us, we like to think ourselves better than others. But true devotees, they like to think of others better than them. In one sense, that's the difference between material consciousness and spiritual consciousness. Material consciousness is because of a vacuum of real satisfaction in the heart. We're always grasping for some things to enjoy. And profit, adoration, and distinction, these are subtle forms of sense gratification where I have to feel myself better than others, and I have to prove to others that I am better than others. But if we actually have the satisfaction of knowing how great Krishna is, we're so happy with his glories and his opulences. He's the supreme source of the ultimate fullness of all beauty, all strength, all fame, all wealth, all knowledge, all renunciation. There's nothing left for us. He has everything. He's the proprietor of everything to limitless degrees. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita that whatever good things you see in this world is just a spark of my opulence. So when we find satisfaction in Krishna's opulence, then there's no need to try to claim it to be our own. And in that way, it's a great joy to see how Krishna's empowering someone else. And they're better than me. That's blissful. When we actually feel bliss in doing that, we know we're really making some spiritual connection in bhakti. But when we're envious, or when we're arrogant, that means we're still very much in the clutches of maya. So, even devotees, we have to be very careful. Satrajit was a he was like a king, he was a prince in the Yadu dynasty. And one day, he came back to Dwarka. And he was so effulgent, incredibly effulgent. People couldn't even see who he was. They thought he was the sun god, Surya. And the residents of Dwarka came running to Krishna's palace and said, Krishna, that because you are living in Dwarka, all the great demigods are coming to see you, and now the sun god, Surya Dev, has come to meet you. And Krishna said, that's not Surya, that's Satrajit. You see, Satrajit was such a great devotee of Bibishwan, the sun god. 
the sun god considered him like his own friend. He worshipped Surya, but Surya, you are my friend. And he gave them, he gave Satrajis this Shamantaka jewel, which is very, very precious. According to our Acharyas, the Shamantaka jewel was the jewel that Kuvera gave uh, Shankachuda, who was a demon. And because of having that jewel, he was so beautiful. He had such unbelievable opulences that he became proud. And he came to a place near Govardhan, which on the day of Holi, Krishna and Balaram were with gopis and they were all singing together. Srimad Bhagavad Goswami describes how they could sing. Krishna and Balaram, they could sing every note of the scale simultaneously. It's like you and me, we can go, sa re ga ma pa da ni sa Yes, but can you say all of them together? And they were chanting, each of them was chanting, it was so beautiful. And they were doing it for the pleasure of the gopis. And the gopis were so happy. Krishna and Balaram were trying to please his gopi devotees in such special ways under the full moonlight just in the spring season. And Shankachuda, because he was, he had such wealth and such strength and such beauty, and he had the Shamantaka jewel, he was thinking that he was the enjoyer and who could be better than me? And it's almost like the effulgence of that jewel blinded him of being able to see who Krishna and Balaram were. And he decided, who is this Krishna Balaram compared to me? These gopis are mine. Because this is the tendency of the ahankar, the false ego. We want to be the enjoyer. Janasya mohoya mamhammameti. That I am this body, the designations of this body are me, and whatever is in relation to this to body is mine. In Queen Kunti prays, Janmaiswarya Shruti Sribir, that material opulences, the things that materialistic people really strive to obtain, such as wealth, fame, beauty, high education, they're great disqualifications for our spiritual life because they blind us. They infatuate the false ego and the false ego blinds us of, of understanding who Krishna is. And when we become proud, we can't really call out Krishna's names with feeling. Even our spiritual activities become relatively ritualistic. The purpose of all spiritual rituals on the path of bhakti have a philosophical purpose behind them. They're offerings of our love, of our devotion, of whatever we have, our body, our mind, our words, our property. We're making an offering, some siddhira haritoshanam, to please Krishna. If Krishna is not pleased by whatever ritual, by whatever memorization of verses, by whatever charity we may give, by whatever austerities or renunciation, if it's not pleasing but to Krishna, Srama Evahi Kevala. 
we just, it's a waste of time. Our whole purpose is just to please Krishna. And the more we think that I am the doer and I am great, I am independent, the farther we are from, be able, from being able to actually recognize our total dependence on Krishna. Trinadapi suniche naturot ibasishnana. Amani namana dena kirtaniya sadahari. Therefore, to chant the holy names of the Lord with quality. And the quality in which we chant is what attracts Krishna, the all attractive. Humility. The joy of honoring and respecting others. The joy of seeing the good fortune and blessings coming upon others. The ability to tolerate anger and ego like a tree. Those are the qualifications. Akinchana gochana. So Shankachuda. He was so blinded. He was right in the presence of Krishna Balaram. And he's trying to take away their gopis. Now for most of us, when we're in the temple of Radha Gopinath, Radha Ras Bihari, we're a little more careful than we are when we're walking down the streets because we are aware that Krishna's watching us everywhere we go, but he's especially watching me here. <laughs> well, he was right there at Govardhan Hill in Braj Bhumi with Krishna and Balaram. And he was so much an illusion, he was thinking the gopis are mine. And he was taking them away from Krishna. And they were calling out for Krishna and Balaram's help. Krishna told Balaramji, you wait here, be with the gopis, I'll take care of him. He picked up a log and chased after Shankachuda. And when Shankachuda saw Krishna running after him, he became a little awakened. But instead of surrendering, he ran away. <laughs> There's different ways of responding to Krishna once we recognize. <laughs> he ran away. Now who could run away from Krishna? This is a good lesson. <laughs> if we do something wrong and we think we could hide, we think we could run away, it's not possible. First of all, Krishna is in our heart. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam. So wherever we run, he's, he's right with us. This is a blessing for devotees, but it's a dilemma for people who want to do immoral activities. You can't escape Krishna. He's within you. He's outside of you. He's everywhere, personally, through his energies. So he ran, <laughs> and Krishna caught him, and <coughs> liberated him. Then he brought back the Shamantaka jewel, which is what made Sankachuda so arrogant, especially, it aggravated that propensity within him. And he gave it to Balaram in the presence of all gopis. Sri Rupa Goswami explains, later Balaram gave it to Srimati Radharani. And after Lord Krishna, with Akrura, left Brindavan for Mathura, Srimati Radharani, Yamuna, the river Yamuna, she is the daughter of Surya. And her brother is Yamaraj. 
And Yamaraj is very, very affectionate to his sister Yamuna. So if we get the favor of Yamuna, then Yamaraj will give us special um, consideration. <laughs> And by the grace of Yamuna Devi, who is an expansion of Srimati Radharani herself from Goloka Vrindavan, Sri Radha was brought to meet Surya. And she presented to him the Shamantaka, which is such a precious thing. It's a gift of Srimati Radharani to Surya Dev. And Surya Dev was so affectionate to Satrajit. He gave that same jewel to him. So obviously, it's a, it's it's a special type of Mahaprasad. <laughs> but unfortunately, Satyajit kind of had the same influence of the jewel that Sankachuda did in his own way. He was a yadu. But he became very, very attached to it. And when he came back to Dwarka, he got the very high quality Brahmins who could chant mantras and yantras and tantras and do their mujas and pujas excellently. And created a beautiful temple for the Shamantakachu. And had these Brahmins worshipping very, very um, Attentively. And through his worship, the Shamantaka jewel was providing 170 pounds of pure gold every day. Now, I don't know if any of you know gold prices these days, but Ananda Vrindavan, you know about gold trading? <laughs> Approximately how many rupees is the value of 170 pounds of pure gold? Yesterday the rate was 10 grams, 37,6 <laughs> <laughs> Give him a microphone, this, is, this sounds quite comprehensive. Yesterday the rate was uh, for 10 grams of gold was 27,600 rupees. For a gram? Uh, 10 grams. 10 grams of gold. So 10 grams, how many of those equal one pound? Krishna and Prabhu, how do you know about that? <laughs> He's our senior most brahmachari. <laughs> he doesn't come so often, now we're getting a clue of where you've been. <laughs> Say again. Twenty-five times. So how many rupees is 170 pounds of gold? About two and a half crores. Yes? Personally, I think it's more. <laughs> because it's much better quality gold than you get. <laughs> In Mumbai, you don't get this quality gold. <laughs> and he's getting that much every day. So wealth gives power. Wealth gives fame. It's an opulence. Krishna is all attractive because he has all opulences in full. And ultimately he's Rasa Bihari, he's the supreme lover and the supreme object of love. So. Satrajit Ayadu became quite distracted and overwhelmed 
by the opulences that he had. And Krishna, Krishna's Sarva Bhuta Maheshwara. He's the supreme proprietor of everything that exists and he's also everyone's best friend. Whatever Krishna desires is always for the ultimate benefit of everyone. Suhradam Sarva Bhutana. And Krishna suggested to Satrajit, you shouldn't keep this jewel for yourself. Give it to Ugrasena, the king of the Yadus. Because he's the king and whatever he has, he distributes to everyone for everyone's benefit. But as long as you think that you're the proprietor, it's going to cause you trouble. But Satrajit got distracted because you see, there's a rule that whoever worships the Shamantaka jewel, everything becomes auspicious. There could be no death. There could be no disease. There could be no unhappiness. Not only you get all this gold, but there's so many benedictions and blessings that come from worshiping the Shamantaka jewel. But they're all material. And all these material blessings, you can't really put your faith in them. Because like everything material, it just doesn't work that way. Not always. I know people who went to best astrologers and they said, you will live till 71 years old. You will live till 85 years old. Then they die when they're 22. <laughs> so the stars were saying 95. And when they're dying, they're saying, no, no, this can't happen to me, the stars have said. But nothing in this world is steady. You can't really depend on anything. You can depend on just a couple things that are always going to be true. One is that you will die. <laughs> Two, that Krishna is always non different than his name. So in every situation, our real faith should be in the chanting of the Lord's name. Hey! If we put our faith in any of the ever-changing situations in this world, even benedictions and blessings and all of this stuff on the material platform, Kamala Dala Jala Jivana Talamala. Ultimately, it's all like a little drop of water on a lotus leaf and could be gone any time. So devotees don't put faith in any material promises. They put faith in Krishna, who's within his name. But Chatrajit, he had more faith in this material promise than he did in Krishna. And Krishna knew that you're becoming distracted, you're becoming infatuated, you're becoming arrogant and proud, you're thinking that you're the possessor, and that tendency, that seed of greed, even if you're in the Yadu dynasty, if you're not very careful, that seed is its being nourished by your being the proprietor of such a valuable jewel. So Krishna, for such a just own welfare, he said, give it to Ukrasena. You see, trying to find happiness through our abilities, our wealth, our knowledge, whatever it may be, it's like trying to satisfy a leaf on a tree by putting water on the leaf of the tree. 
Yes, we're all like little leaves on the tree of Krishna's creation. And we're trying to get this much water to put on ourselves. And we might look a little shiny for a few seconds. But ultimately, our true welfare is in watering the root of the tree. And when we water the root of the tree, not only do we benefit, but we actually give the greatest benefit to all. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he gave this instruction to all people from India, para upakar, that the greatest welfare work is to teach people how to water the root of the tree through devotional service to Krishna. So Krishna is giving this Ugrasena is the king. He's the representative of God for all of Dwarka. He's Krishna's relative. Krishna personally empowered Ugrasena to serve as the king of all the citizens. If you give your Shamantaka jewel to Ugrasena, I will be pleased. And then the benefits of that jewel will benefit everyone in Dwarka, not just you. So Krishna was thinking of his own welfare, Satrajit. But because he was infatuated by having that jewel, he couldn't hear the words of Krishna. He couldn't put faith that Krishna is truly my well-wisher. Rather, he thought Krishna was like a competitor, trying to take my jewel away, and he refused. I'm sure he politely refused, but he refused. <coughs> and because he displeased Krishna, all the so-called material benedictions and blessings and promises that come with that jewel had an opposite effect. And that's what this story is about. Greed is such a um, power of illusion. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita the nature of lust and greed. It is like fire in the heart. It burns. And when you try to feed fire fuel, the fire gets hotter and hotter and hotter and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger a fire gets, the more it needs. Yes. If you just have a little fire, you just put a little drop of ghee on it and it's happy. But then it gets bigger. <laughs> and then you need two drops and then you need three drops. And when it's a blazing fire, it's consuming houses, it's consuming I, Chicago. I'm from Chicago. There's a famous place called the Water Tower. Back in the end of the 19th century, sometime there was the Great Chicago Fire. It was the second largest city in America. The entire city was burned down. And the reason the water tower is so famous, it's the only building that survived in the city. It's a stone building. And it had a lot of water in it. <laughs> So this is what a fire can do. And fire begins with just a spark. And it's really interesting, whether it's a true story or just a legend, but the story of how the Chicago fire began. Maharaj, do you know that story? May I tell? Huh? <laughs> what did he say? He's from New York. <laughs> well, my obeisance is to you. <laughs> Chicago was second largest, but New York was first largest. <laughs> 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 I 
in every way, he is Maharaja's superior. To him. <laughs> Well, according to the history, some call it a legend, some call it a history, but it's the only story anybody ever knows about it. Just somewhere in the outskirts of Chicago, there was a lady. Her name was Mrs. O'Leary. And she had a cow. And at night, she milked her cow. And she had a lantern. And after she left, the cow kicked over the little lantern and it caught the hay in the barn. And what is the flame of a lantern? About this big, yes? Maybe about one inch high. Just a little flame. But then that little tiny flame, the cow kicked it, it got in contact with some hay, it got bigger, 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 bigger. <laughs> burned the entire city of Chicago down, second biggest city in America. Now it's interesting because America, Chicago, Chicago had the largest slaughterhouse in the world for cows. It was called the Union Stockyards. When I was a little boy, when, whenever my family would drive in that area, my father would say, close all the windows, because it was horrible. So the place where the cows were being mistreated so much, the cow got her revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and with one little kick burned down the whole city. Hadi hadi. So we should take care of cows very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite um, symbolic, actually. Srila Prabhupada was very, very strong about cow protection. And Srila Prabhupada's idea of cow protection was in the mood of, of Krishna and Balaram. It's not just not killing the cows. It's in loving the cows. It's in giving happiness to the cows. In one lecture, Srila Prabhupada said, the barometer, a barometer is what evaluates a particular level of a thing, like the temperature. The barometer of the spirituality of any society is how happy the cows are. Because cows are completely dependent on the compassion of humans. And the, the spiritual culture of human heart is based on this principle of compassion. So Krishna in Bhagavad Gita tells that greed and lust are like fire and it can completely consume our life if we give in to even a little piece of it, just a little flame. If we're not conscious of the potential of that little flame, it could burn down everything. And this is why knowledge is very important. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas, he was beautiful, he was 24 years old. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, I must teach you Vedanta, otherwise how will, you under how will you maintain your integrity as a sannyasi? In other words, knowledge teaches us you know, how to deal with these little flames that are within us. Because if we don't understand what that flame potentially can do, we can seriously be burnt. Just like a little child plays with fire. The little child doesn't know that this little fire could, build, could burn down my whole house, could burn to a crisp all my loved ones and family, 
could burn down the whole city. He's just thinking, oh, it, it's so, it looks really nice and it's fun. Right? <laughs> but a parent has knowledge of what its potential is. So transcendental knowledge, we understand the potential of what lust, envy, anger, arrogance, and greed can do. It, can, it could cause us to make operats. We become so proud, we make offenses to others. And when we make offenses to others, it's like a fire. It could burn all our propensity for devotional service, all our taste for the holy name. What to speak of put us in such a dilemma. So, knowledge, when Kunti Devi says that too much knowledge, wealth, beauty, fame, high birth, these things are like fire. Now, if we really are humble devotees who are very cautious, we understand the benefits of the fire. Fame and beauty and knowledge and all these things, if they're under the control of Guru and Krishna's instructions and they're utilized with humility, Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, they're Krishna's property to be used for Krishna's purpose. They're not mine. So I have nothing to be proud of. I have nothing to be envious of. I'm just servant of the servant of the servant. If we have that spirit, then having knowledge is a great, like fire. Fire can cook so many japatis. <laughs> And it could cook paramana, sweet rice. And it could keep, keep people warm in the cold months. All the lights in our temple, it's all um, various ways in which we process fire. Electricity is nothing but processed fire. So when fire is under control, it has such incredible benefits. So whatever abilities, whatever intelligence, whatever opulences Krishna gives us, if we use them in the spirit of servitude, they have great benefit. But if we don't understand that connection, then that fire goes out of control and it burns us. Knowledge even knowledge of scripture and knowledge of Sanskrit. If we have that humble position of being a servant, my, it can give us such incredible um, opportunities to serve and enlighten society. But if we think it's mine, if we think it's about me, and we become proud of having it. It burns us. And it burns so and when we get burnt, we burn so many people around us. It's very difficult. So Krishna, who a little later from this story is going to speak the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> he's teaching us. And he loves Satrajit. But Satrajit isn't recognizing Krishna's love and Krishna's protection because he's blinded by greed. Krishna sees what's going to happen. But Krishna doesn't, he gives us every opportunity to do the right thing. But in order to facilitate the most perfect love, he does not interfere with our independence, our free will. 
So in this sense, Krishna tells Satrajit, for your own benefit, for everyone's benefit, give the jewel to Ugrasena. If he gave that jewel to Ugrasena, that offering to Krishna, we would be reading something so different in the Srimad Bhagavatam today. <laughs> but he was attached to it. So many times we hear from Bhagavad Gita, we hear from our gurus, we hear from senior Vaishnavas, what's the best thing for us? But due to certain attachments, no. Maybe, maybe later. But now, but this story is a good reminder how the nature of fire. You know, if your little child is playing with fire and the mother says, no, no, and the child says, no, no, let me play with this fire. Let me just play for another 15 minutes. <laughs> then I'll give you the fire. What can happen in 15 minutes? To go out of our control. So Satrajit kept the jewel. And he kept all the benedictions and blessings that come with the jewel and he had so much confidence. And all this gold was coming every day. And he was beautiful. He was effulgent. And one day he let his brother, Prasena, borrow the jewel, who went on his horse to go out on an excursion. Now the thing about having worldly opulence is it attracts people, the wrong kind of people, to want what we have. Yes? It's like Srila Prabhupada gave an example. He came to America. He, if you go to poor parts of America, there's no locks on the doors. There's no beware of dog signs. But if you go to very um, wealthy areas, there's gates, there's security systems, there's guards, and there's <laughs> dogs to intimidate you. Because, you know, when you have a lot, you know that people want what you have. And is it a blessing or a curse? You want a lot of stuff because you want to be free of the fear of being poor. And then when you have a lot, then you're even more afraid. Because you're afraid of that now everybody wants what I have. And then I'll be poor again. <laughs> And to keep wealth, you have to really work. You can't just, now I have. Because there's so many, there's the taxes, and there's government, and there's thieves, and there's relatives, and so many people who want to take it away from you. So it's very difficult. So if, um, if Prasena just decided to like wear a Kanti Mala. <laughs> he would have been protected. <laughs> he would have gone on his excursion, he would have come back to Dwarka, and everything would have been really nice. But because he was wearing the Shamantaka jewel, not only did he look very opulent and beautiful, but everybody, so many other people want to have it. So a lion wanted that jewel. <laughs> and the lion attacked him killed his horse, and then killed him, and took the jewel. So much for the benediction. <laughs> that, it, that you would not die, and nothing inauspicious would happen to you. So when Prasena didn't return, Satrajit, he was so blinded by attachment and infatuated by this ego of having so much wealth and power and fame and beauty. You see, the world is like a mirror of our own minds. 
and according to our desires, we judge, we think other people are like that. When you are attached to something, you look at others and think that they must be attached to, because if I'm attached, then they must be attached. So because Satrajit had this evil in him, he was thinking, Prasena, he didn't come home for so long. Krishna wanted me to give that jewel away. Krishna must have killed Prasena to get that jewel. That's what he was thinking. And he was a yadu. He's a devotee. See how he became distracted. Can happen to any of us. We have to be careful. Nasta Prayeshu Badrishu. That's why we hear Bhagavatam every day. <laughs> to remind us that in this world, Padam Padam Yadva Vipadam Natesham. There's danger at every step. In our spiritual lives too. We have to be very alert and aware. We need the association. We need the holy names. We need the Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. Nasta Prayeshu Badrishu to keep us alert. So he began to spread rumors against Krishna that just to get my jewel, Krishna must have done something to my brother. And he began to spread rumors. And the rumors started circulating. And more and more people, according to Shukadev Goswami, were whispering these rumors. Could you imagine if Satrajit had access to internet? <laughs> In those days, all there was was talking. But the talking was spreading. But our acharyas explain, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, that it was only people who had evil tendencies, like Satrajit, that listened and took seriously these rumors and spoke them. The good devotees, they would not listen to it. They would not speak it. The people who have evil tendencies, as Jayadoita Swami Maharaj was speaking yesterday this concept of prajalpa, this taste for criticizing and finding faults with others. If we have that, that's a, that, that's a sign that we're, that we're really pretty far away from Krishna consciousness. Rupa Goswami explains that the symptom of a devotee, a true devotee, who has pure devotional service, is they have no tendency to criticize or find faults in others. Their greatest happiness is in glorifying Krishna, is in glorifying Krishna's devotees. Sometimes when devotees would, would find faults in other devotees to Srila Prabhupada, he would say, you are, you are criticizing the dark spots on the full moon. Just the fact that he's a devotee, like a full moon. Why not see the light of the moon and the beauty of the moon? Why the spots? So here's Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, who's all beautiful, who's all merciful. He himself created the whole of Dwarka. <laughs> and people are talking criticisms of him. Because that propensity was still in their hearts. And these are yadus. So Krishna 
And Maharaj spoke very beautiful about the principle of, of how those who are leaders, they have to live in such a way that they're above suspicion. So Krishna went out himself to clear his name to find Prasena, and he brought some people with him. And there he found the dead body of Prasena and the horse. And then they traveled a little further and they found the dead body of the lion. Little did that lion know when he took the Shamantaka jewel, he was thinking, I'm getting something so valuable. And he did. But when you have something, people envy you and people, other people want it. And Krishna went with some of his devotees to a big cave that was pitch dark inside. And Krishna said, you wait here, I'm going in. And he went in the cave. And there he found this little boy who was playing with the Shamantaka jewel as a toy. He didn't understand the value, he was just playing with it. And Krishna wanted the jewel <laughs> to bring back to Dwarka, to clear his name. Because people were talking. Krishna stole the jewel, Krishna killed Satyajit's brother. When he came closer to the little boy, the nurse screamed. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, she didn't scream in fear of Krishna. This is one evaluation, that she saw this incredible personality, Krishna, <laughs> coming to take the jewel away from the little boy, and the nurse of the boy is screaming. According to him, she saw the beauty of Krishna, and she screamed in ecstasy. <laughs> but you see, you have to be a connoisseur of rasas, like Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, to be able to finally calculate what is the motive behind a scream of a nurse. <laughs> so Jambavan, who was the father of that little boy, he came running. And he saw Krishna about to take the toy of his little child. Because what happened is Jambavan saw the lion with the jewel, and Jambavan fought the lion and killed the lion, and then took the jewel back to his cave and gave it to his son. His son wasn't producing 170 pounds of gold every day or having Brahmins worshiping it. He was just playing with it like you would play with a with a um, mango seed. You, know, you, give, you give a mango seed to your little child and he starts doing so many things with it, creative things. I often tell the story, and I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> I went to the house of some very, very wealthy people. And to make their money, the husband, the wife, they had to work so many hours every day to make it, to keep it, to expand it. And they had a son. And this son, because he didn't have his mother and father's love so much, they had to keep him busy. So they kept giving him more and more games to play with. And I went into this basement of this beautiful mansion, and this basement was huge. And it was filled with all these computerized games. Unbelievable. There was probably tens and thousands of US dollars worth of toys. And he'd use it for a while, and then he'd want a new one, and then he'd want a new one, and they kept supplying him new ones, and new ones, and new ones. And he was never happy with any of them. And then I went to one little farm, and I saw a little devotee boy. And 
his parents, because they gave him a lot of love and affection and everything like that, and they gave him Krishna, they gave him a seed, an avocado seed, which is something like a mango seed. And he was playing with that seed. It was incredible. <laughs> he was playing with it for days and days. He was making he, he, such incredible creative ideas. He was practically building empires in his own mind out of that seed. I was recently in one place and there was a little boy and somebody came from Kansas and brought a squash, a gourd, a little pumpkin, and gave it to the child. This was in Denver, Colorado. And this little boy, he was riding that little pumpkin like a horse and like a car, and he was playing with like a ball, and practically anything you could think of that anybody would want, he was seeing in that pumpkin. You know, he was just so happy with the pumpkin. <laughs> Simple living. And this boy with all his games and all his pinballs and all the lights and all the computers and everything else, he couldn't find a fraction of what this boy was in a pumpkin, which didn't cost anything. So this little child didn't understand the value of Shaman Takaju. He just saw it's a toy, he's just playing with it, getting it all dirty, <laughs> not, not worshiping it on an altar. Jambavan gave it to him. Because for Jambavan, what's the value of the jewel? Not in gold, in how much it makes his son happy. <laughs> that was the value of it to Jambavan. So Jambavan came running out when he heard the scream of the nurse and he saw Krishna there about to take the jewel from his son and challenge. He didn't recognize who Krishna was. He just thought he was some powerful person. And Jambavan, the strongest of the strong, it describes in Srimad Bhagavatam, begins to fight with Krishna. Krishna reciprocates with according to how we approach him. So Jambavan starts striking Krishna with blows like he struck the lion. But Krishna's not like the lion. <laughs> Can you imagine what a lion was in Dwapar Yuga? They were really, they weren't like lions in Kali Yuga are like are like little mice compared to the lions of Dwapra Yuga. They're like little kitty cats. You know, a little kitty cat goes, <laughs> Well, that's what the lions of today are compared to the lions of before Kali Yuga began. <laughs> Jambavan struck the lion dead. And now this person has come to take the jewel and he's striking Krishna and Krishna's striking him back and the Bhagavatam says they were fighting with weapons. And then when weapons didn't work for either one of them, they started hitting each other with rocks and trees. They were up uprooting trees. It was quite an amazing cave, I guess. <laughs> They were fighting and fighting and battling and when trees didn't work and rocks didn't work and boulders didn't work and weapons didn't work, they were beating each other with their fists. And every blow that Krishna gave to Jambavan and every blow that Jambavan gave to Krishna was as strong and even more strong than a thunderbolt. <laughs> You know, even if the world heavyweight champion punches you, you don't hear. <laughs> you just hear at the most, right? <laughs> so what was their strength? They're hitting each other. <laughs> like thunderbolts. <laughs> and they're pounding each other and pounding each other. And it describes here for 28 days, non-stop, and they were so enthusiastic, they didn't sleep. 
now this is really a fight. Even in Kurukshetra, they would start at sunrise, <laughs> and after sunset, they would all go to sleep and start again at sunrise. And sometimes, you know, after sunset, they would go to their enemy's tent and have dinner. <laughs> and have nice relationships. And then the next day, <laughs> shooting arrows and clubs. <laughs> but this, this battle was so intense, they non-stop day at 24 hours hours every day for 28 days they were fighting. And the whole time Jambavan didn't recognize Krishna. Who is Jambavan? There are many stories, but when the devas approached Brahma and told him about Ravana, and all the atrocities he was committing to the Brahmins, to Dharma, and to people's lives and properties. Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu came to them. Brahma prayed and said, I will descend and all of you demigods should expand yourself in the Vanara, in the monkey dynasty. To, to, to be my devotees and assist me. And the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared in his eternal form of Lord Sri Ramchandra. He descended from Vaikuntha. And the eternal devotee of Ram, he manifested himself directly from the body of Brahma to help. His name is Rikshuraj. And one of the great stories in Ramayan is Jambavan was so intelligent and so powerful and he was so old. When it came the time, Sampati, the elder brother of Jatayu, was about to eat. <laughs> Angada and Hanuman and everybody else. And they just said, oh, Ram, you know, you, just like Jatayu is killed. And he said, Jatayu? You said Jatayu? He's my brother. What happened to my brother? And Sampati said, with my eyes, I could see that Ravana is across the 800 mile ocean in the island of Sri Lanka. I can see Sita there. And that's where they found out where Sita was. They knew Ravana stole from Jatayu, but they didn't know where he lived. So then they were all discussing, who's going to jump over the ocean? And none of them had the power. Angada, the son of Bali, he said, I could get there, but I don't know if I can get back. They said, no, 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 you are our commander. You should not go. And everyone was wondering, because nobody had that strength. Jambavan said to Hanumanji, he said, you can easily do it. And he reminded Hanuman of his great powers. And Jambavan said, actually, when I was younger, I could have done it, but now I'm old. And it describes in the Puranas how Jambavan, at the time of Vamanadev, when he was appearing like a little dwarf, to get Bali Maharaj to surrender. He said, just give me three steps of land. And Bali said, yes. Shukracharya did not like it. <laughs> Bali said, yes. And then little Vamanadev, he became Trivikram. He became so big. With one step, he covered half the universe. With the other step, he covered the other half of the universe. And with his second step, he reached the, the very border of the entire universe and cracked it open with his toe in the Ganga. The causal ocean started coming through. And during that time, while Trivikram, Vamanadev, was in that gigantic form, can you imagine seeing a person? Imagine, this is history, seeing a person 
who with two steps could cover the entire universe. Our scientists cannot fathom the length and breadth of this universe. Yes? How far is the sun from us? Anybody know? Krishnananda Prabhu, you must. According to Krishnananda Prabhu, as far as he knows, it's about 93 million miles away. Yes? That's just the sun. <laughs> what to speak of the rest of the universe? Two steps, he covered it all. And while he was doing that, Jambavan, he was such, he was so fast. <laughs> He was, circum, he was constantly circumambulating Vamanadev in his form of Trivagram. Like, and it's not like it was taking him years. It was just, he was just like, we circumambulate Krishnananda. <laughs> he was circumambulating, circumambulating. And then not only was he circumambulating Trivagram, but he was going to every part of the universe to glorify Lord Vamanadev. So what, 800 miles to cross the ocean for Jambavan was nothing, but he was old. He still had the same power and strength, but his speed was less. <laughs> and he was such a great devotee of, Rava, of Ram. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains why this fight happened, why Jambavan didn't recognize his beloved Lord. Because Jambavan's a Paramahamsa, he's a pure devotee. He was one of the most intimate, loving associates of Ram. But Krishna covered him over because Krishna killed so many demons. Kamsa, Chanura, Mustika. Oh, who are they? They're just, they're just demons. <laughs> Krishna really didn't have to exert himself very much to fight them. It's like Kamsa. You know, there's so much great propaganda about the power of Kamsa compared to us, yes. But for Krishna, Kamsa was there at the... At, at, the wrestling arena in Mathura. And he just, and Kamsa decided, I'm going to kill Devaki and Vasudeva and we should kill Krishna. And Krishna just jumped up there and threw him down in the wrestling arena and then just <coughs> hit him. Kamsa's dead. So what? When Lord, ah, I have a meeting. When Lord <clears throat> Narasimhadev killed Hiranyakashipu, it was just like a dramatic performance. He was fighting with him, fighting with him, fighting with him, but actually, you know, some t every now and then he'd show the reality. He'd capture Hiranyakashipu, and then he'd just let him go. Just like a big cat with a tiny little mouse, lets the mouse go just for the mouse things, just see how strong I am. But it's effortless. But Krishna wanted a real fight. And Jambavan was so powerful. Fighting with little people like Ravana was nothing for Jambavan. Jambavan wanted a real fight because they're Chaitriya. So if Krishna wants a real fight, he has to fight a devotee that he has empowered, and that's Jambavan. And Jambavan wanted a real fight. The only person who could give him a real fight was Krishna. So they were actually really enjoying not rec Jambavan not recognizing Krishna finally fought somebody he could really fight and fight and fight 28 days, 24 hours a day. And finally Jambavan, due to all the thunderbolt blows of Krishna. He was so tired. <laughs> he realized that you're my beloved Lord Ram. 
You are Lord Vishnu, the supreme personality of Godhead, the creator of everything that exists, the source of all strength, the source of everything. And I'm fighting you because I don't recognize you. Now I surrender my heart, my life, my everything to you. And Krishna then reveals himself for who he really is to Jambavan. And Jambavan, in ecstatic love, he gives Krishna, he, he gives Krishna his own daughter, Jambavati, to marry. And he loved his daughter. And then he takes the Shamantaka jewel and puts it on a necklace and puts it around Krishna's neck. That's the difference between Jambavan and Satrachet. As soon as Jambavan realized that this is Krishna, you take the Jamantaka jewel and you take my daughter, my body, my words, my life, everything is your property, my Lord. Thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupada Ki. Krishna's grace upon all of you. I have a meeting, so I have to go. <laughs> I will not speak anything else. I'm so grateful. Jaya Doita Swami Maharaj, before we end, would you like to speak some words of wisdom to enlighten our hearts? The microphone is... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Just by him saying thank you includes all the knowledge of all the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Maharaj. It's such an honor and we're so grateful that you are here with us. Your kindness. Let us all offer our gratitude to His Holiness Jayadoy to Maharaj by loudly chanting Hare. Hare Krishna.